Kirsten Robertson. I'm a clinical psychologist at the University of Tulsa, and I'm here today to talk to you about a topic that hopefully will be really relevant given our current cultural situation and all the things that most of us are facing in this 2020 year. The topic is how do people who work in fields that help other people, so whether we're talking about counselors, teachers, police officers, people in the medical field, like how do the helping profession maintain a sense of trauma stewardship or maintain the ability to self-care without letting all of the things that we see and all of other people's stressful situations really start to affect us. So before I jump in and kind of tell you more about where this information comes from and you know the details of it, I just want to give you an overview of what you can expect from our talk today. So I expect it to last about 45-50 minutes depending on how quickly I get through the material. The first part is going to be me introducing you to the book that I am pulling this concept from and then walking through some of the main points of it. When I'm finished, I want us to watch a TED Talk that was created by one of the authors of the book and she does an excellent job of not only sharing her personal story and how she even came about developing this method for trauma stewardship, but also she talks about just how important it is that we prevent ourselves from numbing out. And that can be really hard when we see and deal with people's stress or people's trauma day in and day out. So hopefully you'll gain some really important tips and tools that'll help you as we navigate um, the upcoming future. So without further ado, I am going to make myself smaller and we can begin. All right, so. As I mentioned, Trauma Stewardship is based on a book, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky and Connie Burke, and if you notice that this topic really resonates with you, I highly encourage you to order it. You can get it on Amazon or in lots of different bookstores. And so trauma stewardship is a practice we're going to learn how to develop, and it's in the face of, you may have heard it phrased, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue. It's what happens to those people who sit day in and day out with other people and help them manage their own situations in some way. Like after a while, when you hear stressful story after stressful story or see traumatic thing after traumatic thing, or you know, depending on the field that you work with, it can start to weigh on us if we're not conscious of it and we don't take steps to prevent burnout or prevent exhaustion or really just to keep us healthy. So the definition of trauma stewardship, as we're going to be working with it today, is it's a daily practice through which individuals, organizations, and societies tend to hardship, pain, or trauma experienced by humans, other living beings, or our planet itself. So one of the understandings that we have coming into this idea is that life has both joy and pain, and these are really natural pieces. You know, and it's also the idea that suffering can be transformed into meaningful growth and healing when a quality of presence is cultivated and maintained, even in the face of great suffering. So if we had a live interactive chat now, I would ask you, what is present and what does it mean for us to bring presence to a situation? And I would really be curious to hear like what your answers are. And so we will talk about this more, but for me, presence is the ability to sit in a room with somebody or to be present to a situation or to some sort of context in which all of me is there right here, right now, in the present moment, and I am able to keep myself open. So that means I am able to have empathy, I'm able to have compassion, I am able to really be with whatever is in front of me, whether it's joy or pain or any of the things in between, and really just show up for it and stay centered in myself. I think that's a big piece is how do I stay grounded and centered amidst things that can be difficult. And so we're going to talk about that more. But before I really get into it, there's three levels. And I don't know if anybody's heard of like Broffenbrenner's um, kind of model, like the micro and the macro and the exos, like these levels of environment that we are all in. 
And anyway, this is very similar to that. So the idea is that there's three levels that are usually going on for us all the time, and they all contribute to how well we're able to maintain this presence, how our stress levels are, maybe how traumatic things feel to us or the people or things we're working with. And so at the very basic level, we have the personal. And the personal is like me. <laughs> me is how I show up. And one of the biggest pieces or things that happen on the personal level are boundaries. And so healthy boundaries are knowing where I end and somebody else or something else begins. It's knowing, you know, when I go home at night, am I able to leave whatever it was I've been leaving with during the day and relax and separate out? Like how well am I able to know what I have control over and what I don't have control over? And so this really can affect us, people that don't have um, very clear boundaries can often reach exhaustion much faster. So we'll touch on this here a little bit more, but moving on to the second level is the organizational level. So these are the companies that we work for or are a part of, and there's two main aspects to it that make a difference in how we feel. And so the first one is ideal versus reality. So for instance, what is the ideal scenario for whatever role we're playing versus what is reality as far as our ability to affect change in that way. So for instance, because I'm a clinician, the examples are easier for me from that place. But like if I was at a community health center and I was serving people that maybe have a lower socioeconomic status and the ideal situation for their care would be that they have stable housing, they have um, a stable source of food, they have a job, they have you know the ability to cover their own basic needs. So that would be their ideal situation. Okay, but maybe reality is, is those pieces aren't all in place and there's nothing that I can do to help affect change. Maybe the organization I'm working with doesn't have the funds to help, you know, connect them with the resources they need or whatnot. So in that case, there would be a large gap between what would be ideal for the person in front of me versus what reality shows. And that can be really stressful, especially if there's, if, you know, if it feels helpless to me, if it feels like, you know, I can't affect change in the ways that I would want to. The other piece that's really important is, is the company that you work for or the people that you work with, are they supportive or are they unsupportive? So, are, you know, do you all get together? Do you share a common goal and mission statement and you all kind of help each other out to meet that? Or is it a toxic work culture? Like, is there a lot of gossiping and backstabbing? Or do you have a boss that cares more about, you know, the quota and the bottom line than about the quality of the services given or whatnot? Um, so those things can really impact how we feel. And so obviously the closer the gap between ideal versus reality and the more supportive environment we're in, the better for us. Moving on to the next layer that I want to look at are societal forces. So we have to look, look at this larger macro system that we're all a part of. How do ineffective, corrupt, or oppressive systems impact the work we do? Oppression plays a leading role in creating and maintaining systems that perpetuate suffering and trauma for all sentient beings on the planet. And so oppression is defined as the negative outcome experienced by people who are targeted by the cruel exercise of power. The term is generally used to describe how a certain group is being kept down by an unjust use of authority, force, or societal norms. I think of the isms. So sexism, racism, ableism, those type of things. And there's, there's many more than just those three. We also want to look at systemic oppression, which occurs when a society institutionalizes the oppression formally or informally. So those concepts then become greater systems that impact. And so it could be the people or the things that we're working with that experience this firsthand. And maybe we feel like there's not a lot that we can do to change those as an individual, or maybe the systems affect us or both and in any mix of that. So really what we want to keep in mind though, is that while oftentimes our experience feels very individual, it feels like, oh, this is just how I'm coping with things. We have to remember that there's all these different levels that are constantly affecting what's going on and how we feel. So the next thing I want to talk about are what are some of the warning signs for, we'll call it compassion fatigue. What are some of the things that should clue you that, hey, I might be getting out of balance a little bit, or you know, the work that I'm in is really starting to affect me, so I might need to make some changes. 
So there's 16 of them that we're going to talk about. I'm just going to start at the top here. So feeling helpless and hopeless, like it's just too much. A sense that one could never do enough. So this idea that like I should be doing more or just a general sense of not enough. Hypervigilance is when we start to feel like we're always on or where we're constantly being on alert for danger or looking over our shoulder or just kind of like, you know, just waiting for the next thing to happen. Diminished creativity. So think, when is the last time you had an original thought or created something new? When's the last time, you know, that you had the energy and the ability to do this? If you notice that you've kind of lost this or it's um, been diminished in some way, it can definitely be a warning sign. The next one is an inability to embrace complexity. So most of us know that life is rarely black or white. You know, usually the answers to whatever it is that's in question fall somewhere in the gray. It's usually um, has a bit of complexity to it. So if you notice that um, you're looking for clear signs of good, bad, right, wrong, or a need to choose between one of these signs, it could be a sign that you need to pay some attention. So minimizing. This is when we trivialize a current situation by comparing it with another situation that we regard as more dire. So it's hierarchying somebody's pain. So we lose our ability to have empathy and compassion. So maybe like if I'm a counselor and somebody's telling me about like, you know, how their day was. And then in the back of my mind, I have this voice that's going, oh, well, you know what? This person doesn't know how great they have it because my four o'clock client, boy, they've really got a lot going on in their life, you know? instead of approaching it as pain is pain and it's all valid, you know. Another one is chronic exhaustion or physical ailments. A lot of times um, stress can show up physically for people. So this is not just tired. This is like completely drained. So mind, body, and spirit. We may get into a place where we feel like we have no choice about what we are doing. This may cause our immune system to get lowered and we may find that we get colds more or sick more, which eventually could lead into serious physical illness. So the next one is an inability to listen or deliberate avoidance. So I'm thinking of somebody, maybe in the profession you're in, you do house calls or you go to people's houses. So imagine like going up to the door and intentionally not knocking very loud, hoping that somebody may not answer. Or you're sitting at your desk and you call purposely at a time that you don't think they're going to answer so you don't have to talk to them. Or you don't answer your phone when it rings just to avoid the situation. And this could just be because you just don't have the energy or the ability to deal with it or face it. Another one is dissociative moments. So this is when you may experience intrusive or overwhelming feelings, or you may just completely zone out in whatever you're doing. A sense of persecution is feeling a profound lack of efficacy in one's own life. So it could even be choosing to remain powerless in the face of adversity. It could show up as like the thought, look at all the ways I'm being exploited. It's like when we feel like life's just happening to us and we forget that we have choices. The next is guilt. So when we feel guilty regarding the disparity between what we may see in our lives and what we see in the people we serve's lives. So we may stop being honest, which prevents authentic connection with others. Guilt can stop us from feeling pleasure, peace, or happiness, and is one of the strongest signs of having a trauma exposure response. We cannot forget to see the beauty in life along with the pain. And it also means that we are allowed to have beauty in life. And when we appreciate our beauty, it's actually what may give us the ability to stay centered in presence and then help those people that we're working with learn to find the beauty in their own lives as well. Another one is fear. So this could show up in a lot of different ways. It could be a fear of intense feelings, fear of vulnerability, fear of maybe being potentially victimized yourself. So maybe if you work, you know, as a police officer and you constantly go to scenes to where people are being broken into and then you're at home and you realize like you're way more afraid that you're about to be broken into. So it's just a sign that some of the trauma may be getting to us. Anger and cynicism is the next one. So anger at the source of injustice, it could be at the, our organization or the clients themselves, just to name a few. And anger is fine if we resolve it in a positive way that does no harm and results in creativity and positive change. It can be destructive if we don't channel it appropriately. 
So cynicism can be a coping strategy for dealing with anger and is often a way to avoid feeling. So it's not a helpful use of our anger, and that's what we're looking for. So inability to empathize or numbing. So this is when our system becomes overwhelmed by all the incoming stimuli and we shut down or numb out. We may notice we're engaging in activities that help us numb, like substance use, overloading caffeine or sugar, and that kind of leads us into our next one, which is addictions. So these can be the usual things we think of, drug, alcohol, food, sex, um, anything that has a rush of adrenaline, or it can also be that we're addicted to work. Maybe you notice that you don't take days off and you work long hours during the week and you're, you just don't take a break, which also kind of leads into our last one, which is grandiosity. So this is just an inflated sense of importance related to one's work. If I don't do it, who else will? So we may lose our sense of our own capacity and our limits, along with our independence with others in the field. Like when we get to the place that we feel like I'm the only one that's going to make this change, rather than realizing that most things take a village. You know, we're usually a part of a bigger system. And so we also may narrow our identity to this one role and make it all important and tied to our self-work. You know, if I, don't, if I don't do an amazing job with these really obvious results, then I'm failing as a person. So these are just, you know, some really good things to keep in the back of your head. And if you start to experience them, there's good news. I mean, there's something that we can do about it as long as we can be conscious about it and take action. Um, and that leads us into our next slide. These are some of the things, according to Bessel van der Kolk, that are key areas of stress resistance. So... This first one, creating spaces for inquiry, this is related to that individual level that we talked about before. And so this is when we actually um, ask questions about ourselves and do some self-reflection. So how has my own past experiences shaped the way I interact with life now? Is what I am currently doing working for me on all levels of my being, or am I out of alignment somehow? Why am I doing what I am doing? So maybe, for instance, I grew up in a home where I learned that overachieving was the best way to get love, right? And that my love was dependent on that. And now as an adult, I'm currently overextending myself, currently seeing how much I can do. And it's coming from this kind of past history that maybe I haven't looked at. And so I will mention that um, because I'm also like I'm a mental health clinician, so maybe I'm a little biased in this, but I think having a therapist when you're in the helping field is one of the best preventative and helpful things that one can do. Um, I look at it like, you know, it's really nice to have somebody who is sworn to confidentiality with the exception of a few circumstances. So it's a safe place for me to talk about whatever's bothering me. But also it's a place where I can start to see like, what are my blind spots? Or maybe I have some of these patterns that I've never even realized that were still playing out in my life. It can be really helpful sometimes to have somebody just really help us look at what what part of us is contributing to the dynamic we're in? Is there And is there anything we can do to change it, right? Is there any pieces that maybe, you know, aren't working for us like we thought they were? So the second one is choosing our focus. So I have so many different areas that I am passionate about and would like to see change in regarding our world or, you know, my career. But I have to remember that I only have so much energy. Like I am still one person. So choosing our focus is just about kind of prioritizing and being realistic about what we can actually do and what's going to be the best use of our time so we don't spend it all splintered and fractured and then, you know, it goes back to this whole theme of exhaustion. And so maybe I choose that, you know, this month I'm going to focus on this area that I really like and read the books about that and kind of learn about it. And then I'm going to set it down, but come back to it later. And next month I'm going to shift on the next one or, you know, there's no right or wrong way to do it, but it's really just prioritizing what we do with our energy. The third one is building compassion and community and compassion is not only the ability to see things through a lens of compassion. So it could be, you know, the way other people are responding or other contexts or just life in general. But I think it's also compassion for ourselves. I think a lot of times it's like, you know, am I being really critical on myself and picking out all the ways that I didn't measure up today or the things I forgot to do or the things I could have done better? Or am I saying like, hey, 
you know, maybe there's a little bit of room for growth here, but look at all the stuff I did well today. You know, look at the fact that I'm still showing up and it was really hard. Like kind of switching that inner voice and the way that we see ourselves and view ourselves can be a game changer. Um, and then the last one, well, community, let's talk about that. So community, not only is it so important that we have a support system, but I think especially in the helping profession, like sometimes our immediate circle of friends may not be able to understand, you know, like if you're an ER worker and you see traumatic scenes often, it may be hard for people who don't work in that same line to understand, or maybe it's like traumatic for them to hear you tell how your day went, you know, or if you're in a um, field like me, you know, there's confidentiality and I'm not allowed to talk to everybody about, you know, what my day was like. And so I think community can also look like, you know, finding people who are in the same role as you are, who understand what the experience is like and having your own support group so you can debrief, like just having that place to be like, you know, yeah, it was hard. And then, you know, knowing that other people are going through it as well can be super helpful. And then the last one is finding balance. So the sheet that I have on the right side of the screen is one that I really, really love. It's based on Virginia Satir's work, and it's just a quick guide. So it's um, eight big life domains that are all really important and that can get out of balance. And when we when they do get out of balance, we can feel it. We can feel it in our mood. We can just feel it in the way our body feels. Like it, it, it really makes a difference when we take time to kind of gauge which areas are we overachieving in? Which areas are we underachieving in? And can we kind of make some changes to get them more in balance and see if we can tell a difference in how we feel? Especially important around nutrition, around sleep, around you know physical activity. Those things really make a difference. So um, this is a picture or an image that the author of the book created. And it's basically, so... Not only is it done, it's done in the directions like north, south, east, or west, but also water, air, fire, earth. And then those same four areas that I just talked about, you can see written up here at the top corresponding to the different directions. And so um, practicing self-care is incredibly important. Having a personal sense of control. So this is uh, realizing that the connections between my actions and the way I feel, like I have some power to change it, right? Like there's a, life doesn't just happen to me without me having any say at all. Like I actually have a lot of ability to make changes that will directly impact how I'm feeling and how things are going for me. And so um, realizing like, what do I spend my time focusing on or, Maybe it's time to have a different perspective. Like maybe I need to change up the way that I'm viewing things. And sometimes it's, you know, as easy as creating a plan B. Like for instance, maybe in the moment I don't have a lot of change. Like, you know, with our current situation, the pandemic, like, you know, there's some things that are in place that I have nothing to do with. However, I could realize though, I'm still making the choice to ride it out and then, you know, if things don't change over a period of time, then maybe I can come up with a plan B. Well, if you know, then I can tweak here, do something there, you know. So just realizing that we do have choices, even if we're choosing to hang on. Um, being patient, realizing that a lot of times our work are small daily steps and not one quick fix. So just realizing kind of, you know, having realistic expectations around it. And then also cultivating a sense of gratitude. So going back to the life is both joy and pain, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in what we don't have or what's not going well. And we have to remember to pay attention to what is. Pay attention to the beauty that is there that's showing up, even if it's a mix of all of it, right? It can really change how we're feeling. And so Bessel talks about like when he saw what he defined as a stress resistant person, they tended to have these four things in common. And so the first one is kind of what I was already talking about, which is just having a sense of personal control. The second is the pursuit of personally meaningful tasks. So this is like, this is going to vary based on the individual, but 
this is when you become present and engaged in your own life and you do things that you know you're passionate about or have meaning for you in some ways and so he noticed that when people did that it helped them continue to stay active rather than passive when then the challenging times came so healthy lifestyle choices so I'm from Seattle and I drink a lot of coffee and I will admit that to you <laughs> and probably sometimes more than I should. However, I'm aware that sometimes when I stop and I don't drink coffee and I get it out of my system that I'm less jittery, right? And so if we're already at a place where we are feeling anxious or we are feeling on edge or just paying attention to what we put in our body and how it may affect us. So it's not that there's anything wrong with the substances themselves, but for instance, you know, if I am used to drinking about two pots of coffee and then all of a sudden I'm feeling on edge, I may want to notice that I should cut down on the stimulant. So a lot of the times Bessel noticed that stress resistant people did consume less of stimulants. So sugar caffeine, nicotine, and the like. They also tended to seek out periods of exercise each week and then also found a time each day for a period of relaxation. Even if it's five or ten minutes, you would be surprised how much it counts to just be able to pause. The last one that he noticed is that they had social support, which then served as buffers when dealing with difficult life situations. So this brings us back to the idea of staying centered. So of the five direction sheet that I showed you two slides ago, the very middle one, which is what makes up the fifth direction, was being centered and present in our lives. So it's getting out of our head and into our body and taking time to cultivate the ability to stay in the present moment. So this is tuning into our felt sense. So how do I feel in this current moment? It's paying attention so you can identify what your own wants and needs are. And this is tuning into how your body feels, not just thinks. A lot of times we get in this place of hyper-intellectualism, and that occurs when we abandon our felt sense and attempt to move out of our bodies, hearts, and spirits and only live in our head. Instead, can we combine our felt sense and our sense of meaning, creating a more balanced view? So it's one of those things that, you know, like intellectually, critically thinking about things and using our cognitions, like it's a super important part of life. But sometimes what happens, though, is we stay in there all the time and we neglect to really check in with ourselves because we can get a lot of information if we just pause and say, how am I feeling right now? How does my body feel? And allowing us to really tune into that. Making time for stillness is essential. And so when we are able to make ourselves as still within as a mountain lake, we have an exquisite reflection of all that is in and around us. And that comes from a quote on page 134. So I think centering basically is just learning to stay in the here and now and not racing ahead, worrying about what's about to happen in the future. It's not dwelling on what's happened in the past. It's really being present. And so there's a lot of ways we can cultivate this ability. So I think people think of meditation immediately, in which meditation is amazing for a lot of people, um, but it doesn't have to be just sitting on a cushion. And I will say, though, for most people, if you're not used to it, it's a discipline and it's difficult at first, but it's one of those things that over time, it really starts to get be better. And it's something that when you learn the skill, you can then apply it when you're out in life. So it's not one of those things that you just do for you know 10 or 20 minutes a day and it doesn't affect you. It's like, no, what I'm practicing here is then applicable in all these other areas, especially if they're high stress. And so something that I really liked that she said in this book is that through the previous changes and practices, we will develop the ability to center ourselves and return to this centered place on a regular basis. It's from this place that we can truly help others. So it was a decent amount of information that I just gave you, but I hope that it made sense. And I hope that this is a guide to kind of help you navigate any stressful times in the future or navigate sustainability in our helping profession, because what we do is so important and it's so needed. And we are going to affect the most positive change, no matter what career we are in, 
when we learn how to give in a way that is sustainable. So I am going to transition now and let Laura tell you the rest. This is a really amazing TED Talk. And, you know, every time I watch it, when I leave, I just feel so inspired. So I really encourage you to hang on and let's watch this together. And uh, I appreciate your time. Eighteen years ago, I found myself standing on top of a very tall cliff, having what I would only come to recognize many years later as a near psychotic break. It would be fair for you to ask if I had always been that on edge, and the answer is no. But as many of you I imagine can relate to, how I found myself on top of that cliff on that particular day was by way of a very long road. Like so many others, my childhood was filled with a lot of love and many challenges. Life came into particularly sharp focus for me when I was 10 years old. My mom, who was the healthiest person any of us knew, went into a doctor's appointment for what everyone thought would be a diagnosis of pneumonia at the worst and returned home having been told she had a very rare form of lung cancer. They gave her three months to live. She lived for three years, much of that time with one lung. And so she died when I was 13, and the sun rose and set with my mom, and I entered into my adolescence feeling if continuing to live wasn't going to be impossible, it was going to be highly improbable. So I navigated high school with a lot of overachieving. I spent my days getting straight A's and working three jobs, and I spent my nights planning on how I could end my life without causing my older brother, who'd always been my protector and my role model, too much pain. I did make it through high school, and then I landed in college, and I found myself sitting in one of those very large lecture halls, and my professor at the time, Professor Richard Applebaum, was talking to us about suffering on this one particular morning. In particular, he was talking about homelessness. And he was talking about it in a way that allowed time to stand still for me. He was building on what so many traditions have taught us for the beginning of time, really, that in life, it is said, there's equal measure of brutality and beauty, of pain and pleasure, of annihilating moments and of sublime moments. And yet there was a way he was talking about it, this whole conversation about equanimity that was completely new to me. So during those three years when my brother and I were taking care of our mom, we were surrounded by a number of very, very loving people and kind people who gave us a lot of support for appearing to be stoic, for seeming to be strong, and for holding it all together. And what Professor Applebaum was talking about on that morning is when one is engaged in suffering, there is so much more to it than holding it all together. So what I knew was I wanted more of whatever he had going on. So I went up to him after class, asked how I could help. He scribbled on a piece of paper the name and number of our local homeless shelter's director. And that's when I started volunteering at age 18, spending the nights regularly volunteering in a homeless shelter. I went on to work with all forms of trauma and always within this kind of larger backdrop of systematic oppression and liberation theory. And what I knew was that I was so grateful that I had found something that made sense to me and that I felt passionate about. What I had no idea and wouldn't know for years to come was to what degree having borne witness to the suffering of my mom and then the subsequent years of bearing witness to so much suffering with so many people, to what degree that was taking a toll on me. And this is something that wise people have passed down for a long time and we know more and more about now because of the advances in neuroscience and the wonderful research that many of my esteemed colleagues are doing. But at the time, I had no idea about this cumulative toll. So one of the ways that the toll can show up is for those of you who are doing work. There are folks who do work, and as a result of the work you do, you might be exposed to things, either because of the content of what you're doing, but what a lot of my colleagues say is like, look, the work itself is the least of my concern. It's all my colleagues who put me over the edge, right? So sometimes the toll is because of the work. Sometimes the toll is because of the caretaking we do on our lives. Here she's saying, I feel like I need you less and less, Mom, now that I can make myself feel guilty all on my own. <laughs> so much of the toll we feel is because many, many, many of you are caretaking in your personal lives. You're caretaking those around you. You're at home tending for folks who are returning from wars, folks who are ill, people who are in need in the community. Sometimes the toll we feel is because of the suffering of other living beings. This is Chris Jordan's wonderful work. And sometimes it's because of what's going on ecologically on the planet itself. This is the work of Vance Friedenberg. He's one of the leading scientists looking at the sixth mass extinction. But what we know is that when humans are exposed to 
to suffering, hardship, crisis, trauma of humans, other living beings, or the planet itself, there's a cumulative toll. And there's a toll on us individually. There's a toll on your immediate relationships. There's a toll organizationally for those of you who have this exposure in your work. Institutionally, systemically, we see it in movements we're a part of. We're seeing it throughout all of our communities and society as a whole. She's saying, speaking personally, I haven't had my day and I've never met any dog who has. <laughs> the other piece of this that's very important, at least when I do this work, is it's always held in a larger context of systematic oppression. You know this so well, but a reminder that the degree to which you're impacted by the lives you're living and the work you're doing is intimately tied to the fact that we're in a society with so much supremacy. And if we're in a society where there's no oppression, there's no racism, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, classism, and xenophobia, so much of the suffering we are tending to wouldn't exist, and the remaining bits that exist in life, we would all be affected by that so differently. I have no doubt that all of you have so much more insight and personal awareness than I did back in the day, and that for those of you who know what this toll is and when you feel this toll, either because of what's going on in your personal lives or on the job, that you're able to identify it. But I was not at all able to identify it. So it was about 10 years into my career when a critical mass of people started kind of getting up in my face doing that, hey, Laura, you're tripping. You should take some time off. And I'm sure somebody said something earlier than 10 years in, but I was very stubborn and successfully ignored them. But 10 years in is when there was a critical mass of people up in my grill really begging me to look at this. And what some of you will appreciate is that a number of those people were clients I was serving, which you can imagine is always so disconcerting. You know, <laughs> survivors of domestic violence living in a shelter who can't go anywhere, begging me not to come to work. So people were doing their due diligence, right? But at the time, I was so arrogant, I was incredibly cocky, and I was entirely self-righteous. I was doing God's work. You could either step up and help me do God's work, or you could step off. But I was definitely not going to have a conversation with you about how I was affected by my job. And like many of you, possibly, I was raised in a number of traditions that implicitly and explicitly communicated, if you care enough about what you're doing, if you are down with your cause enough, if if it matters enough to you, you're going to suck it up. So this whole conversation about how to sustain was not something I was engaging in. But finally, the pressure mounted. I caved. I didn't take any significant time off, but compromised. We took a short trip, went to visit our family who lived in the Caribbean. So on a particular day, we head out as a family on this hike, and we get halfway through our hike, and we summit what we wanted to summit, and there we are standing on the top of these cliffs, right? So the family's gathered around, tiny Caribbean island, standing on the top of these cliffs, looking out. The first thing I remember thinking was, this is so beautiful. The second thing I immediately thought was, I wonder how many people have killed themselves by jumping off of these cliffs. Right? And at the time, I worked at Harborview Hospital, which you know is the level one trauma center for the whole Northwest. So it wasn't my own suicidality at play anymore. It was because of the years of bearing witness to other suffering that naturally, instinctually, one starts triaging, of course, right? So you start thinking, where would the helicopter land? Does the helicopter land on the cliff? And would you belay down to the person on the beach? Would the helicopter actually land on the beach? Is there a level one trauma center in the Caribbean, you ask yourself? Do they fly you to Miami? Would they stop you in customs? You know, you kind of go through the whole thing, right? <laughs> So I said this out loud because I was merely presuming I was just giving voice to inevitably what was going to come up in a family conversation because who stands on top of a cliff and does not wonder where the nearest level one trauma center is. <laughs> but apparently in my family, nobody was thinking that. So it got even quieter than it had been, really long, very uncomfortable pause happened, and ultimately it was my stepfather-in-law who said, are you sure all this trauma work hasn't gotten to you? <laughs> and honestly, this was the first moment I had any insight into, you know, check it out. There are people who can go on a hike and not wonder where the nearest level one trauma center is. But I'll tell you, it wasn't me, it wasn't anybody I was hanging out with, right? Because one of the things about this toll is it's slow moving. It is very hard to gauge over time, individually and collectively, if we are being affected by what we're exposed to. And also what happens is we get very isolated. So this was one of those moments that maybe you've had where kind of everything starts flooding in, right? And then I was like, oh, well, if this is the case, maybe it's also the case that there's people who still date out there in the world, and those people who date aren't doing back 
background checks on everybody they date, right? <laughs> Maybe there's people who can go to a playground. It's just a lovely place for children. You're not worried about like head injuries or Amber Alerts hat, right? So, but this is what happens that over time, what you're exposed to affects your entire worldview. There's so many ways that we can be affected individually and collectively by exposure to vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, secondary trauma. Many people call it many different things. But this exposure affects all of us so differently. What I have found through the privilege of getting to work with everyone from zookeepers to judges, school teachers to nurses, ecologists to activists, is that it is breathtaking the commonalities of how one is affected. Right? So some of the ways we find you feel like you're not doing enough, right? So here they're saying we just haven't been flapping them hard enough. So this is where you feel like you're not doing enough. You constantly feel like you should be doing more, right? Another one could be morale. So they're saying, I see you've done time, so working in a cubicle shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> So I work with organizations nationally, internationally, and one of the things we find so much is the morale, the very, very quickly eroding morale. Right. Here he's saying, I bark at everything. You can't go wrong that way. So hypervigilance, many people can relate to a sense of hypervigilance. This is where you lose your ability to flow in, you know, really fluidly in between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. You become in kind of a hyper arousal. I had a colleague say to me, she was a child support enforcement officer, and she said to me, I can tell you which ones of my son's friends are going to grow up to not pay their child support. <laughs> And her son was five years old, right? <laughs> Here he's saying, no, not there, please. That's where I'm going to put my head. So exhaustion is something many people can relate to. And not the exhaustion before you work out, but this is an exhaustion where you are tired in your soul, you are tired in your spirit, you are tired throughout your bone marrow. All of your ancestors were tired people, <laughs> right? There is the avoidance. He's saying, no, Thursday's out. How about never? Is never good for you? This is where the best part of your day at work is where you don't have to do your job, right? And then there's the avoidance in our personal lives. She's saying, it's too late, Roger. They've seen us. <laughs> Cynicism, many of you can relate to. They're saying, but she'll come down eventually, and she'll come down hard. So what many of you might be able to relate to is not the pure cynicism, but the cynical humor, right? And then anger and rage. He's saying it's a new antidepressant. Instead of swallowing it, you throw it at anyone who appears to be having a good time. <laughs> and here he's saying, I can cure your back problem, but there's a risk you'll be left with nothing to talk about. So the other thing we see here is the externalizing that happens. When more and more people are asked to do more with fewer resources, we see this whole seduction to externalizing. So this is where you start saying to yourself, you know, I would actually be fine taking care of my loved ones if I could have different loved ones to take care of. Or people say, I would love coming to my job every day if my immediate supervisor would just retire, right? <laughs> And then there's blind spots that we have. So one of the things that we notice a lot that people have is blind spots. I'll share the story to illustrate it. This is a water bottle. It says the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. It's one of approximately, you know, over 100 water bottles I have in my home that have been gifted to me like incredible programs that many of you are involved with, right? And every water bottle I have in my home has something stenciled on the side like this, which has, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, HIV AIDS, infant mortality, flood, hurricane, tornado tornado, tsunami, death, destruction, right? And I'm just thinking, this is great. I got water bottles. Every day is Earth Day here. This is fantastic. But what it also means is these are the water bottles that go with my kids to swim meets, basketball tournaments, <laughs> soccer games, right? And I'm not thinking anything of it. But then I was unpacking my child's lunch some time ago, and I noticed that at school she found the provisions to kind of hack over the word sexual, right? So she's not exactly old enough to know what sexual violence is. She's definitely old enough to know you're not sitting at the lunch table at school with a water bottle that says domestic and sexual violence on it, right? I don't know why, but I decided to tell this story at a very large conference of police officers. And when the break came, a police officer came up to me, two centimeters from my face, 20 bucks in her hand, and said, go get your kid a proper water bottle. <laughs> so I feel like you know things have gone very wrong in life when you've got the cops giving you cash, instructing you on parenting, right? And then dogma and self-righteousness, okay? So here he's saying, your mother and I are separating because I want what's best for the country, and your mother doesn't. <laughs> and then addictions, which many of us can relate to. She's saying, of course I drink during the day. I'm way too tired to drink at night. 
and numbing. So here he's saying, could we have the dosage? I still have feelings. One of the things I want to say to us about numbing, it is incredibly seductive with the volume and the intensity of suffering on the planet today. It is incredibly tempting and seductive to become numb. And what I want to offer to you is how critical it is that we continue to strive to cultivate our capacity to be present. One of the reasons we want so much to be present is we remind ourselves with everything that is out of our control every single day, one of the things that remains in our control at any given time is your ability to bring your exquisite quality of presence to what you are doing and to how you are being. That presence we know can interrupt the systematic oppression which is causing so much harm and can transform the trauma that is arising. It is very easy to get in that place of you have no idea what my life, if you lived here, if you did my job, if you saw what I saw, and that's when we call on our ancestors and that's when we call on so many people who have come before us who remind us that when they could not change anything external, they were able to shift everything as a result of where they put their focus. And again, I don't know any of you personally, but the assumption I'm going to make is none of us would go up against any of these folks, right? We're not going to, oh, Desmond, I know things got rough for you in South Africa, what with apartheid and all. But here in Washington State, we got a few things going on, right? <laughs> here he's saying, this is the barn where we keep our feelings. If a feeling comes to you, bring it here and lock it up. The other reason I want to bring us back to presence is I want to remind you that while I know we have so many different life circumstances, I believe we have a shared ethic of doing no harm. If you are numb, you will not be able to gauge whether or not you're doing harm. And if we believe in what Chief Self talks about with the web of life, or what Martin Luther King talked about with a single garment of destiny, you all know so well that there are so many parts of this web that are profoundly compromised. And many of you are bringing heart and soul to tremendous sacrifice to tend to parts of this web that are compromised. If the way you're doing that out there means in any way you are neglecting your immediate part of the web, cutting off circulation to your immediate part of the web, lighting your immediate part of the web on fire, it is not ethical practice, it's not integrity-based practice, it's not sustainable. The other piece with numbing out and what we've learned from so many people who have come before us and in so many traditions is you don't get to selectively numb. So if you're going to numb out your sorrow, you're also going to numb out any possible happiness you can have. If you are going to numb out the heartbreak, you're going to numb out any ability to survive noticing what is beautiful. And the other thing is your mind and body and spirit will keep trying to bring itself back to a full range of feelings of that whole equanimity and that spaciousness. Which means that's why, you know, you can work on coalition after coalition of peace building and then you get in the lunch line or on the freeway and you don't let anybody merge in front of you, right? And we defend that. We say how I conduct myself on that freeway or when I'm getting my food at lunch has nothing to do with the other work I'm doing. <laughs> Howard Thurman reminds us, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So we remember that with the magnitude of suffering at play on the planet right now, we are in desperate need of folks who have the wherewithal and who have the courage to be present. We know from that place of presence, it is possible to aspire to do no harm it is possible to transform whatever trauma arises, and it is possible to continue to work to dismantle the systematic oppression which is causing such a legacy of suffering. From that place of presence, we know that it is possible to metabolize whatever arises in life, the waves of life which will continue to present to us what they present. There is a way to metabolize that and integrate it so that over time you find that it contributes to your awakening. That the longer we get to walk on this planet, we find we have deeper compassion, vaster humility, and we are able to come up and out of the narrow places. And from that place of cultivated presence, we remember that it is possible 
to create and to sustain an ability to be truly transformative. Thank you.